Uh, thank you, Paula, uh, and your co-conspirators and graduate studies at NYU for having us here. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, being invited to come and the opportunity to delve into subject matter again for, I think, the seventh time. Um, a note on the slides, this is a collection of about 140 slides, photos, images, ranging from when I first started documenting Marshall McLuhan's library up until two days ago. So um, there's a whole bunch of things there. They all relate. Um, and I'm just going to let it run through. It should cycle through a couple times before I'm done. Uh, enter through the bookshop, McLuhan Mono Graffiti. In the many conversations around or about Marshall McLuhan, what often gets either lost or ignored is the fact that he was, for his entire career, an English professor, a teacher of literature and poetry. He came by it honestly, for his mother was an elocutionist who performed dramatic monologues on stage, and though he started university in a mechanical engineering program, the summer following his first year, he read himself into English at night, following long days on a surveying crew in the Manitoba North. Following that first year, and the summer working as a rod man on a surveying crew in what cannot have been pleasant conditions, Marshall left engineering for the arts program at the University of Manitoba. It's hard to say whether he fell in love with literature or out of love with engineering. Maybe it was a bit of both. Whichever was the case, Marshall took a turn for the verse, if you'll forgive me. <laughs> Is the world better for it? Again, it's hard to say. Had Marshall's mind and energies been applied instead to the field of mechanical engineering for the following decades, it's impossible to say what kind of contribution he would have made, um, but it's a fun exercise to think about. What we can say with a fair degree of certainty is that had he not taken on studies in English literature, he would not have learned the techniques of criticism which he would eventually apply outside of literature to culture and technology with world-changing results. Though Marshall was my paternal grandfather, I came to know him most personally through his library. Because I was less than three years old when he died, I didn't have the opportunity to get, him, uh, get to know him well in person. Aside from some pictures of him holding me as a baby in my father's arms beside he and my uncle Michael, stories of nonsense conversations we both enjoyed, not much remains for me of our lives together. By the time I was on my way in, Marshall was on his way out. I have, however, had many opportunities to get to know him through though he died when I was so young. A great advantage of the times in having a somewhat famous grandfather is that I've had the privilege of reviewing the many traces of him left in the world. This is particularly the case because Marshall was so present in what we call for convenience's sake, the media. Marshall was interviewed, participated in panel discussions which were recorded and anyone, uh, which anyone can watch online. There are also hours upon hours of audio recordings. He died long ago, but his presence among us is quite substantial. He also left behind an amount of published material in the form of essays, book reviews, pieces of literary criticism. He wrote books and an impressive amount of letters. He was interviewed by major and minor magazines and newspapers around the world. He delivered speeches and their texts and transcripts remain, as do his notes for still others. While he died on the last day of 1980, so much of him remains in the public, publicly available. And when people ask me where to start with McLuhan, I often point them there to watch him give a speech, participate in dialogue with diverse figures of the time, be part of the dialogue themselves. Growing up, I eventually learned that my dad's dad was somebody other people knew of or had heard of. Tucking Ezra, our oldest, who just turned six, into bed a couple of nights ago, I told him I was putting together some pictures for people to look at while I talked to them for half an hour or so about Papa's dad. He thought this was a good idea, adding some pictures. He didn't really understand why I would be talking about granddad, though. I'm afraid I had to resort to Trump. <laughs> 
you know who Donald Trump is? Ezra nodded. Well, Trump is famous for being president, president, I said, to keep things simple. My grandfather was also famous, but for being a teacher and a philosopher. A puzzled look. A philosopher is someone who thinks a lot about things, about the nature of things, why things are the way they are. Ezra seemed to buy this. Actually, I said, I'm going to down there to talk about Granddad's library, his books. And Ezra didn't know what to make of that at all. I wonder how it will go for them. What will McLuhan mean for my boys, Ezra and his younger brother Virgil, when they're older? As a teenager, I thought I'd see what the fuss was about, and I waded into understanding media for the first time. I confess I didn't do much more than wade, most of it going over my head, while I earnestly studied the surface. I didn't get all that far, and I gave up. Screw it, I said to myself, perhaps a little more strongly. If people want to know what the medium's message means, they can read the damn book themselves. And I recommend you do. And that was it for several years. Fast forward some years and I've moved from Toronto to the countryside a few hours drive east, an area called Prince Edward County, which is being hyped these days as Toronto's Hamptons, following something of a Pinot Noir gold rush in the last decade or so. Locals love that. My father, Eric, had inherited Marshall's books. What was left after his papers went to the National Archives in Ottawa. He inherited the library the way a son might inherit a workshop. It was McLuhan and son for many years. Dad had returned home from his stint in the US Air Force and went to work with his father, traveling with him, Harley Parker, Ted Carpenter, to Fordham University, editing the Dewline newsletter, working together on many things, including what they called UMR, or Understanding Media Revised, that would eventually be published as Laws of Media, The New Science in 1988. Eric had inherited his father's books because they were their tools. Marshall had gathered them, they both used them, and Dad kept using them after his father died. About 10 years ago, Dad decided it was time for the library to move on to where it might be preserved and used more widely. But while an amount of books were on his own shelves for reference, the majority were in storage. And really, Dad had his own library, his own tools to refer to and use. Marshall's library wasn't doing anyone or itself much good packed in boxes in a barn. But while Dad had a fair working knowledge of Marshall's library, there was no sort of inventory. And before the library could really go anywhere, we had to know exactly what it was made of. At the time, I wasn't up to anything much and was offered and accepted the job of making an inventory. I spent the better part of two years doing that, and I may have gone a little beyond the job description. I can't believe you printed that whole thing out. I haven't done that. That's, I have to see that. To my delight, I discovered that the library was much more than boxes of books. I've actually learned and thought a lot about libraries in the year since, and though this is about the seventh time I've talked about it, I managed to find fresh things to say every time. I'm glad, uh, John, that, that phrase about the living library uh, stuck with you because, it, yeah, it's, that was actually the key part of that talk that I gave, how alive a library is. Taking the job seriously, I created a spreadsheet to make a detailed inventory, and I went through Dad's library and pulled Marshall's books off his shelves to document and pack them up. I noted the title, author, publisher, and date. I described the condition. The first thing Marshall did with many of his books was to write on one of the first available surfaces his name, the date, and where the book was purchased. So I added a column in my inventory to make note of these details because it was interesting to me, relevant to my task, which had grown from a basic inventory to include more of the character of this library and of Marshall's contributions. Also, I didn't know what was going to happen to these books. No destination had been chosen. It could very well be I would never see them again, 
so I wanted to make as much of a record as possible to pay attention to what was passing through my hands and to document as much as I could. My time was not unlimited, even though I managed to string it out for much longer than I imagine was expected. I had a small digital camera, a Canon PowerShot, and I made good use of it. This was a little before everyone had an iPhone or similar burning a hole in their pocket and head. It became apparent that this library was significant and worth sharing, and I started a blog which I called Inscriptorium, and I spent a bit of time with the more interesting discoveries sharing them online. Uh, it's inscriptorium.wordpress.com if anyone's interested. The books in Marshall's library span just about 50 years, with many from the early 1930s in books, books, books through the decades, right up to his death in 1980. In fact, there are a couple of books that were inscribed to him after he died in 1980, which is kind of interesting. That acquisition information is a wonderful thing. With it, you travel to England with him, to North America, from St. Louis to Windsor to Toronto and you meet family, friends, and admirers along the way. You see what he finds interesting, of note. You watch him point out what the author missed. You see how Marshall worked, how he developed his ideas with the unwitting collaboration, and probably with no thanks from them, uh, of the authors whose books Marshall read. Marshall, always keen to find evidence to support his own ideas, confirmation of suspicion. You're with Marshall as he makes wild and surprising connections between subjects, putting authors into dialogue with each other and himself. Marshall, ever alert and watchful, adding relevant clippings between the pages, reviews from the New York Times. You learn a lot about Marshall from his library, if you are lucky like I was to spend some time with it. I wasn't prepared to learn so much, I didn't expect it to be so personal, looking at books he first looked at almost a century before. In Marshall's library, you can watch him grow. There is the writing of a young man who has won a scholarship to Cambridge University. He worked his passage across the Atlantic on a cattle boat to save the little money he had, make a little more to spend on books. By his account, it was an awful trip. He had previously enjoyed sailing, had even built his own sailboat, which he noted had capsized at one point, damaging some books. But he was unprepared for the hell of tending cattle across the Atlantic Ocean. The handwriting of McLuhan at Trinity College is elegant, flowing. I'm glad that timing worked out there. <laughs> he makes long notes, quotes professors from his classes, as the years progress, the handwriting changes, becomes less flowing, more staccato. The speed of his thoughts make for shortening of notes, brevity, and abbreviation. If a book is useful once, for Marshall, it's often worth revisiting. As his mind and ideas mature, he revisits most, his most useful books, and the notes he leaves behind, the nature of his handwriting, bring you with him. You see how he catches things in later decades he missed earlier. Some of his books contain so much annotation that running out of room, he adds pages or even buys additional copies. The funny thing about the Finnegan's Wake copies, he had five or six of them. Somebody at one point, and I think it was John Culkin, had a set made for him that interleaved blank pages in between every page. It ended up being a three volume leather bound uh, set, which was so nice that Marshall couldn't bear to make annotations in it. So it just sits there, which is funny. In the margins, he indexes, he jokes, he puns, he scolds, he discovers, he reports. On one occasion, making a note for the first time, he said the medium is the message, in May 2011, I reported it on Inscriptorium. The note is written alongside the title on page 350 of From Source to Statement by James M. McCrimmon, 1968, Boston Houghton Mifflin Company, where the medium is the message, chapter one of Understanding Media is reprinted, and Marshall wrote. 
first used this phrase in June, question mark, 1958, at Radio Broadcasters Conference in Vancouver, was reassuring them that TV could not end radio. Finding that note in Marshall's hand was exciting, and it started me on a sort of quest uh, which is almost at an end nearly 10 years later. With the help of a few people, I've tracked it down to a speech Marshall gave at a conference at the University of British Columbia between May 5th and 6th, 1958. And as it turns out, there was a copy of the transcript in our files in the scriptorium, which is what we called Dad's office, a small converted barn in the Prince Edward County countryside. Here, as far as I've been able to tell, is the first time Marshall McLuhan public stated, publicly stated the medium is the message. Quote, this is page six of that transcript. Print, by permitting people to read at high speed and above all, to read along and silently, developed a totally new set of mental operations. What I mentioned earlier becomes very relevant here. The medium is the message. The medium of print is the message more than any individual writer could say. It's kind of tidy how that brings us from there, a radio broadcaster's conference at UBC in 1958, to here, a conference about Marshall McLuhan's reading habits in New York City in 2020. I gave this talk the title of Enter Through the Bookshop, McLuhan Monograffiti, because I was trying to think of a title and it sounded cool. Uh, and I thought clever. I happen to be very interested in street art and of Banksy's work in particular. But a title like a library is a funny thing. As Marshall quipped, the effects shall precede the cause or what's a metaphor. The more I think about it, the more I find of note in bringing Banksy and Marshall McLuhan together. That Banksy is an artist playing a role is quite obvious by his use of secrecy and pseudonym. That McLuhan is an artist playing a role is less obvious, but no less true. McLuhan, like Banksy, made the world his workshop. He went from the page to the stage. Banksy, like McLuhan, challenges the audience to reflect and to react, to act. They are both artists in the sense of people provoking their audience for a particular and quite intentional effect, to wake them up, needling the somnambulists, as Marshall said. Marshall had quite definite ideas about art, more than enough for a separate talk. Taking his cue from Ezra Pound, who said the artist is the antenna of the race, Marshall leaned heavily on the arts and artists because it is the artist who is on the edge always looking for meaning, looking for what's new, sharpening their senses to be able to perceive things in new ways to make sense and to report back. Why that should matter to an English professor becomes clear when you read some of his early work, early letters, and even moments later uh, on, wit on when he peeks from behind the curtain to tell us what he was up to. Marshall said that in order to perceive the environment, we need an anti-environment to make it plain, a wall for the shadows to fall on. Art grabs our attention and holds it while it does its other job. To which T.S. Eliot in 1933 wrote, the chief use of meaning of a poem in the ordinary sense may be, for here again, I am speaking of some kinds of poetry and not all, to satisfy one habit of the reader, to keep his mind diverted and quiet while the poem does its work upon him, much as the imaginary burglar is always provided with a nice piece of meat for the house dog. In 1964, in Understanding Media, Marshall wrote, for the content of a medium is like the juicy piece of meat carried by the burglar to distract the watchdog of the mind. Street art is literally the writing on the wall. I appreciate street art most when it acts as an anti-environment, drawing our attention toward what we're missing. Banksy did a lovely take on Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring, where he picked a brick wall 
with a round security alarm fixture and used it as the earring superimposing Vermeer's piece around it. Some years ago, I actually sent Banksy a copy of an essay Marshall wrote in 65 titled The Relation of Environment to Anti-Environment, Care of His Publicist. Uh, I couldn't find Banksy's mailing address. I found out who the publicist was and contacted them for a mailing address, and they said to send it there and they'd pass it on. Whether or not he received it, I don't know. And I actually kind of obsessively followed Banksy's work for the next six months looking for any hint that he had read it. But no, I don't know. Anti-environment counterculture. In 1951, Marshall McLuhan wrote to Ezra Pound, I am an intellectual thug who has been slowly accumulating a private arsenal with every intention of using it. In a mindless age, every insight takes on the character of a lethal weapon. Every man of goodwill is the enemy of the society. Lewis saw that years ago. His America and Cosmic Man was an H-bomb let off in the desert. Impact nil. We resent or ignore such intellectual bombs. We prefer to compose human beings into bombs and explode political and social entities. Much more fun. Lewis clears the air of fug. We want to get rid of people entirely. And it is necessary to admire the skill and thoroughness with which we have made our preparations to this. I am not of the we party. I should prefer to defuse this gigantic human bomb by starting a dialogue on the sidelines, in the margins, to distract the trigger men or needle the somnambulists. In London, 1910, you faced various undesirable states of mind. Since then, the world has been used to effect a universal hypnosis. How are words to be used to unweave the spell of print? of radio, commercial, and, quote, newscasts. I am working on that problem. The word is now the cheapest and most universal drug. In his letters, in his annotations, Marshall reveals what he was up to. He used his position, his platform, deliberately. He was a grammarian and a rhetorician. I'm not going to get into dialectics. Similarly, Banksy is a man on a mission, on the frontier, calling us on our bullshit, pushing, challenging. These days, I'm spending some time inventorying and documenting my father Eric's library, of which you've seen pictures. As might be expected, it has a lot in common with Marshall's. The books are very similar, the method of engagement also. And the experience is as rich for me as when I inventoried Marshall's library. I'm getting to know my father in a whole new way. I write this in Dad's library, the scriptorium, because it is the best place for the job. Marshall's library at the Fisher Rare Book Library at the University of Toronto is a very different thing now. The books are stored down below to be called up on request. The things which used to be interleaved are now in separate files. While you can access the books, you can't access the library as it was. It is now only a small part of a much libra larger library, itself part of an even larger library. My father's library, on the other hand, is a magical place, a single self-contained organism I recently noticed to my delight that it's about the same size as Marshall's Center for Culture and Technology was. It is filled with books and files and pictures and tapes and all sorts of wonderful artifacts. It is a dangerous place. It serves up the most wonderful and unexpected delights. It will set your brain on fire and offer cool water to temper. It always seems ready and waiting to give just the exact thing. So enter at your peril. I will let my father have the last word for now with a selection from a piece he wrote in 2003, which I came across in a file in his library on my desk titled Forward is Forearmed. In the 19th century, poetry switched its tactics 
from providing aesthetic objects for contemplation and enjoyment to providing experiences. After Baudelaire, poems, all works of art, became masks for the reader to wear. A new world had been ushered in by the new electronic technologies, beginning with the telegraph. The inner world of the senses and the nervous system was suddenly transplanted into the external environment. Under these conditions, the new job of the poet was to provide counter environments for the reader to wear, like corrective eyeglasses, in order to adjust and restore the reader's sensibilities. A new poetics calls for new tools, tools that will enable a discerning reader to analyze the structure of situations. Poets began to speak of a derangement de tout le sens and dislocation into meaning. From now on, the message of the poem lay in the kind of perception it afforded the user, the manner in which it operated on the reader. Meaning, in the old sense of semantic content, was no longer the point. Since the symbolists, the function of the meaning or content was to entice the reader into the situation of the poem and hold him there long enough for the poem to do its work of retuning. Henceforth, the poem itself was the message, or massage. Taking his cue from the poetics of the previous hundred years, McLuhan approached technologies of communication as environmental poems that the culture wears and that distort and pervert and shift our sensibilities. To be understood then, media had to be read and studied as poems were read and studied. Thank you. <laughs>